Andy. Hey, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? You know, all right. Wish I was giving this at King's College, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe not this week. It's probably not as fun this week. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure travel is going to be back anytime soon, but who knows? <laughs> How's everything your end? Oh, we're um, we're getting pretty normal-ish. If you, as long as you're fully used to the idea that people wear masks all the time, um, you can do most things here now. The labs are completely back up and running. That's been true for months. We oh, didn't really great. restrict in the winter because they just found no evidence that um, being in the lab um, was uh, uh, when we're live on YouTube. Great. Um, <laughs> this will be cut. Don't worry. <laughs> right. We found um, no evidence of um, community spread at work. Yeah. And so we were able to, you know, maintain the same posture that we did in the fall um, through the winter. So the main thing you saw was that social things, you know, really closed down a lot, but then reopened. Yeah. I guess that's maybe that's why you were able to be so productive last year with all your publications. <laughs> oh, that was just I've been too busy to finish a bunch of people's stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, we closed hard for three months in 2020. I mean, we were genuinely closed for three months. Mm -hmm. um, not close. Uh, we couldn't come to work except to keep like mice alive. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was luck. And then a lot of focus to take advantage of the luck that the papers happened to be at that level. Yeah. If we were shut for the next three months, I wouldn't find nine papers to write. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one or two, but yeah. Okay. Um, Lucky timing, I guess. Yeah, you got to take advantage of, you know, it's life's about what do you do with the cards that are dealt you more than it's about um, planning it all out. Okay. Do you, do you want to check your PowerPoint sharing is okay? I mean, sure, I guess it should be okay, but. Just let me just flip over here, share screen. What fraction of the audience comes from sort of where for this? Um, I think people are from everywhere. Okay. All over, we've got, yeah. Is this changing? Yeah, it looks good. It's all in presenter mode. Yeah. Okay. And is this Perfect. movie playing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very smooth. Great. Great. Perfect. Thanks. Changed it up at the last minute and decided this was a good venue to talk about why we study cell migration. <laughs> Sorry, why we study cancer metastasis instead of continuing to study only cell migration. Yeah. Right. I guess we'll get started in a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. And We're five minutes after a crowd at Hopkins, so I wasn't yeah, expecting exactly. to start. Do you want, um, do you prefer to see some faces while you're talking? Do you want me to ask people to turn on the cameras? I do like it if people can, okay. um, especially since I see a number of friends in the crowd. So if you're already here, please do turn your cameras on. Say hi to Andy. There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All Yeah, well, I do really look forward to in-person conferences again. I hope we do continue these kinds of virtual seminar series because it is a really neat thing to be able to talk to whoever wants to hear. Yeah, I think you get to hear from a much wider audience than you normally would do on a week-to-week -week basis. Yeah. No, my lab's been really, as soon as you um, let me know about this, I sent it to my lab as a series and they've been really enjoying it. Oh, great. Nice to hear. Okay, maybe we can get started and people will continue to roll in over the next few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so hi everyone. Uh, so Jennifer's on the road today, so it's just me hosting. Uh, but we are really delighted to have um, Andy Ewald as our speaker today. Um, so as usual, uh, if you have questions uh, for Andy during the talk, you can either raise your hand and ask them yourself at the end, or you can pop them in the chat uh, and I can read them out for you. Um, so Andy is a professor of cell biology, oncology, and biomedical engineering, and he's also the director of the Department of Cell Biology at John Hopkins University. 
Um, his lab seeks to understand how epithelial cells escape uh, their developmental constraints and acquire the ability to spread and colonize distant organs during metastasis. And his lab has made many and very important contributions to the cancer migration fields uh, with findings of the roles of both the tumor microenvironment as well as cell intrinsic mechanisms of metastasis like EMT, uh, for instance, resolving the role of E. cateria in, in metastasis. And uh, along those lines, uh, I'll invite Andy to share a screen and uh, the floor's yours. Thanks a lot. And someone just asked if it was being recorded and it is, yes. Yeah, so it's being live streamed on YouTube and uh, the recording will be available afterwards as well. All right, let's share screen. Changed up my title at the last minute because I thought this was a really nice opportunity to describe, to tell the story of how I went from really studying pretty exclusively cell migration to thinking um, very much about tumors um, and metastasis for which um, migration is a very important part, but it's not the only thing going on. All right, so my journey to uh, understanding breast cancer metastasis, to the extent we do, really started when I joined Zena Werb's lab at UCSF to try to understand, um, at the beginning, a very fundamental question, which is how do you build a network of mammalian epithelial tubes? So what you're looking at here is two mouse mammary glands. The first one is from about three weeks of age. And Adam, can you confirm that my pointer shows up? Yeah, it shows, thanks. So we're seeing a rudimentary ductal tree in the three week um, gland that elaborates dramatically in size and complexity over the next seven weeks in order to form the network of ducts that will carry milk during, um, pregnant, during lactation. And I was really curious, is this a matter of cell migration, cell division, cell growth? And with the tools available at the time, I think the first big challenge we faced was trying to understand um, how to think about migration in a complex tissue like that. Because our understanding of cell migration arose so um, completely from our understanding um, collectively, including very much work at King's College, um, of how isolated cells migrated on flat surfaces with a prototypical cell having a large lamellopodia, um, using rho GTPases to extend that, um, myosin to retract the rear and migrate forward. And the thing is that epithelial cells, like the mammary epithelial cells, um, face a lot of constraints that fibroblasts or keratocytes on a, on a glass surface don't. Most especially, their connection to each other through um, extensive intercellular junctions and strong adhesive connections to adjacent cell types into the extracellular matrix. So we were really curious, how do you think about this? How do you understand how this works? And we were building on a rich tradition of um, histology in the mammary brain where people had really gone in and looked at a lot of different stages, um, collected samples, fixed them, stained them, fixed them, sectioned them, and stained them. And we were able to understand that the normal mammary epithelium has built up these luminal epithelial cells, a second layer of myoepithelial cells, which have contractile molecular programs similar to a myofibroblast, but still an epithelial cell type inside of the basement membrane. So that's what you mean. When I say we're building a tube, that's the basic unit of tube that's being built. But the crazy thing is that what actually builds the tube is this specialized and transient structure called a terminal end bud, so named because it sits at the end of the tube, which has a completely different organization. Instead of being bilayered, there's many luminal epithelial layers, um, extensive proliferation, extensive cell death, and a really unknown contribution of migration. What had been done before I started on this was really extensive and very productive work overexpressing, deleting, and interfering with genes, and then assaying using histology and various types of IHC for effects on gene expression, proliferation, cell death, cell proliferation, stromal composition. So when I started in my postdoc, there was a terrific um, review paper from Finney and Martin that summarized almost 100 different phenotypes across various um, molecular systems. Really gave it the first comprehensive sense of what are the, what's the basic molecular toolkit involved in building the memory epithelium. So this is really important work to do and it's ongoing in a variety of labs, including our own. Um, and it revealed the requirements for many different genes and pathways, most especially those of the hormones and their receptors and growth factors in the receptors in, in, in inducing the branching. And then proteases, um, in, uh, proteases turn out to have a wonderfully subtle role here, but in, including clearing extracellular matrix and various other transcription factor and guidance pathways. And the great thing about these lists is it gives you your first molecular insight into how this might work. And the problem with these lists is they hide the fact that they can never teach you how the cells initiate, elongate, and bifurcate epithelial tubes, which signaling pathways and molecular complexes are most important, and how these developmental mechanisms are co-opted in human disease. So we wanted to be able to study this in real time, get a sense of how epithelial tubes initiate, elongate, and bifurcate in real time. And so we turned to a classic um, 
um, technique from cell culture is basic idea of explanting fresh tissues onto a flat surface, right? So if you take a look, you take the mammary epithelium, you chop and digest with enzymes, you'll be able to harvest epithelial tissue. Um, fraction, uh, with further digestion, you can get it into epithelial pieces or organoids, um, which you then put down on the 2D surface. And this works great. You can culture, thanks to work done in the 50s through 70s, there's extensive understanding of the um, of the media requirements for most cell types so that you can really get a clear uh, starting point, at least, for how to culture almost any cell outside the, the um, mammalian body. What this doesn't let you do is study how epithelial tubes initiate elongate and bifurcate. Because what you're looking at here is a group of epithelial cells running around on a, on a glass surface, right? They're proliferating, they're migrating, they're forming and releasing attachments to each other, but they're not making epithelial tubes. I got into this field because of discoveries that were made before me in terms of um, advancements in 3D culture, with a critical idea here being that what these cells need in order to manifest their tissue-specific programs of differentiation and to build tissue-specific and organ-specific structures is a 3D extracellular matrix environment, right? So you take that same gland, you chop and digest with the same enzymes, get the same pieces, and then instead of putting them on the surface, of a petri dish, you put them inside a gel of extracellular matrix proteins on top of that surface. This seemingly trivial difference, right? Floating them like raisins in jello instead of directly on the surface makes all the difference in the world. So instead of running around on a glass surface as individual cells, what you see is they initiate as a coherent tissue, they initiate, elongate, and bifurcate new epithelial ducts. I found this tremendously exciting because it gave me an opportunity to study mammalian developmental processes in real time. The other thing that it let us do was work at a scale that was previously accessible only in um, early model organisms, because we can get 5,000 of these structures for normal mouse mammary, for, for normal mouse, um, if we're looking at normal mammary epithelial development. If we're working with patient-derived xenografts, so tumors um, derived from patient cells, we can get 25,000. If we're working with genetically engineered mouse models of breast cancer, we can get from a single tumor a quarter million organoids on the same day of processing. So we can really do very extensive experiments to try to understand how tissue level processes work. So I'm gonna to try to relay a number of lessons we've learned from this and dive deep into a couple of those stories. And on the topic of how does the mammary epithelium branch, we published a series of papers because we were able to under, break down this overall program of network formation of the branching morphogenesis of the network as a whole into a series of cellular processes. The first of which is epithelial stratification. It's so the idea that you have a, a clear cyst, right, which has a bilayered tube and then acquires multiple luminal epithelial layers. So we wanted to understand how that worked and how that multilayered epithelium then eventually initiated and elongated new ducts. And what we were able to show is that there's an asymmetric cell division, that cells that are in contact with the luminal surface and localizing ZO1 to the luminal lining, right? So they're forming tight junctions um, at that apical surface can divide and give rise to a daughter cell, which lacks tight junctions, actually lacks molecular polarity at the level of part three. It's in the cytosol rather than at the apical membrane. And what this is able to do is generate a, a multilayered epithelium with relatively um, immature adhesions, relatively low polarity, and a high ability to migrate. So you see here is that when we're tracking all the nuclei in a convocal movie, you can see that this new bud initiates and elongates there happens to be zero proliferation events um, during this initiation process. And in fact, inhibition of um, proliferation using a fit colon does not acutely block elongation. If you want to build ducts that elongate over centimeters in a mouse or meters in a blue whale, right, you're going to need a lot of proliferation. Proliferation is essential to this process, but it isn't essential to the initiation um, of new epithelial ducts. We then showed that the migratory cells that are leading collective migration have this fascinating um, difference, especially localization of active MAP kinase signal. So we're stimulating branching morphogenesis by addition of basic FGF or FGF2. That's available in the media. It arrives at all cells. But through mechanisms we don't understand, the, the high-level response to this, so the phospho-ERK um, response to that FGF signal is localized to the cells at the front, which have the highest um, migratory behavior, so they're most persistent and fastest. Interestingly, selective activation of MEK1, so in the absence of growth factors in, in the media, selective activation of MEK1 by 
and forced expression of MEK1DD compounds of uh, uh, molecules of phosphomimetic MEK1 is actually sufficient to induce new buds. I continue to find this result fascinating because it suggests that the requirement, which has been genetically shown for multiple different receptor tires and kinase pathways, EGF, FGF, HGF, in addition to the um, various steroid hormone pathways, is fundamentally about regulating a very simple process, right? You get a lot of MEK1, ac active MEK1, the epithelial cells know how to elongate a bud. And you're exchanging that signal back and forth between epithelium and stroma through multiple different classes of RTKs and hormones, not because it's hard to turn on, but because you want to have this potent ability to remodel the structure of, a, of an adult organ be regulated very specifically in time and space. Kind of big surprise, right? There's some of our projects where I can say we saw years in advance how things would play out. And there's others that really arose from surprise. Um, was when we looked at the behavior of individual cells. So here, it's just a um, scatter label. So you're looking at the cytoplasm, or the um, adeno-GFD, you're looking at the cytoplasm of an individual epithelial cell inside one of these elongating buds, right? And I have to say, I was shocked when I saw it, the extent to which this migratory cell looked like um, any other migratory cell going through the um, extracellular matrix. But it's migrating within epithelium, and its contacts, instead of being cell to ECM, are cell to cell. Right? So it's using coherent-based contacts to migrate through this epithelium. We we're able to show that radial intercalation is what enables that um, proliferation to make multiple cell layers and migration coupled to ductal elongation. Because if you imagine you have a beach ball at the beginning and it proliferates inwards, it makes a solid beach ball, right? But it hasn't gotten any bigger. So eventually, in order to um, elongate a ductal network, you need to actually put additional cells at that um, basal most cell surface. And so we show that this actually works by radial intercalation, which is a developmental biology term for the idea that the cell moves from an inner cell layer to that outer cell layer. And so then we were curious of these observed mechanisms that what we'd seen in real-time imaging was sufficient to elongate an in silico stratified terminal end bud. So this is a collaboration with Wayne Broadland and the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Waterloo. And it turns out, skipping a whole bunch of um, hard work, it's not, right? So if we just have those um, proliferation plus the um, migration and the boundary capture, the, the cells um, get captured at the, at the edge of the tissue. Um, it's, it's stochastic, but it's a high probability. It doesn't actually elongate the tube. Instead, you get this lumpy tissue structure, right, which doesn't look like a normal memory epithelium. What it instead looks like is a memory epithelium in which P190 rho G is, is overexpressed, which disrupts the high basal tension of the myoepithelium. So we took that as a clue because Wayne said, hey, look, smooth edges in a tissue have to have high interfacial tensions. So he said, I'm not going to put it in the model until you provide experimental support that that exists here. And what we did is we were able to look at F-actin accumulation at the boundary. And we were able to look at phosphomyosin light chain at the boundary. And we were able to show um, that the cells, as they're arriving, there's a lot of F-actin in the tip as they arrive at the ECM surface, but that F-actin dissipates. Um, and then it's reinforced at the basal surface. And we were able to show that at the tissue edge, there's this phosphomyosin light chain accumulation right in the area where the cells are undergoing radial interpolation. So now, when we incorporate the migration, the proliferation, the boundary capture, and this high basal tension, the cells are able to turn this, this almost random mig migratory behavior into progressive elongation. But it's really the tissue level tension that, that, drives, the, the, um, that drives the elongation. There we go. So what are we working on there right now? We're thinking about how we're working very hard to try to understand how the microtubule cytoskeleton is utilized during branch morphogenesis and how organelle location and polarity are reprogrammed during these transitions from you know, bilayered architecture to multilayered architecture back to bilayered architecture. We're also working hard on understanding how apical polarity and apically localized junctions affect the morphogenetic process. So my laboratory largely works on, we work significantly on um, memory branch morphogenesis, but most people in the lab actually work on metastasis. So why do we work on metastasis? Well, and what is it, right? So metastasis is the process by which tumors spread through the body. So there's a normal epithelium that something goes wrong in that cancer cell. You get an accumulation of excess proliferation, but still inside the basement membrane, right? So that's a tumor, but it hasn't invaded yet. 
When the cancer cells cross the basement membrane is when you say you have an invasive tumor, and then it eventually metastasizes through the body. And we've shown, and I'll provide some data towards that conclusion, um, we've shown that this is typically occurring um, in small groups of cells. They're collectively invading, they're traveling in groups, and they're seeding multiclonal metastases. So we wanted to be able to adapt our, our assays. We were studying branch morphogenesis very successfully. We wanted to be able to adapt them to study both um, mouse models and patient tissue from breast cancer, um, especially primary breast tumors. So the concept here is the same. The tissue is isolated surgically. In this case, since it's from a patient, that's by a surgeon, obviously, and the pathology department needs to release the tissue as available to us. Um, and, and it will not affect the clinical management of the patient. We've We've explanted more than 100 breast tumors so far. Um, and the basic protocol is the same. You chop the tumor, um, digest it with enzymes into these primary organoids, embed them in a 3D matrix. When we say organoids, right, it's actually a West Coast of the US style, right, coming from um, techniques developed in San Francisco by people like Zena Werb and Mina Bissell, right, what we're trying to do here is preserve the, and study the in vivo state. So we're doing acute cultures. We're ready to test our ideas in 24 to 48 hours. And accordingly, we can use a very simple culture we do. There's no strong wind agonist here. We get a large number of replicates per sample, and we have this working in mouse and human primary and metastatic site um, tumors. Um, we published an extensive protocols paper last year in Nature Protocols, if anyone's interested. So let's take a look at how this works, right? So we have a primary human breast tumor here. Stage 3C, 20 out of 20 lymph nodes positive, right? So that's as disseminative a tumor as someone can be diagnosed with without yet showing evidence of clinical metastasis. And in the same extracellular matrix environment in which we were studying branch morphogenesis, this wickedly dangerous tumor is actually going, undergoing a pretty good program of branch morphogenesis. Specifically, what you're not seeing is cells migrating out into the gel here, right? So everywhere that's just sort of pale gray is major gel, so laminin one, collagen four. And you're not seeing cells migrating out there. It took me a long time to realize that it wasn't something, and it, this was confusing initially, right? Because you have a highly invasive and disseminative tumor that's not invading or disseminating into your extracellular matrix, into your assay, right? So it took me a long time to understand that it wasn't our, that our assay was broken or wrong or incomplete, right? It was that I was thinking about the problem wrong. I was thinking about tissue invasion and dissemination like a switch on the wall that you flip, right? And once a cancer cell is invasive, it'll manifest that invasive behavior across environments. And this just turns out not to be true, right? In, invasion and dissemination is a dialogue between a cancer cell and tumor microenvironment. So we hypothesized that maybe breast tumors required specific microenvironments in order to invade and disseminate. And we, we hypothesized that it was actually, the difference was the fibrillar collagen one. And I have to acknowledge, if you look at this um, histology slide here, the brown um, over here is the, is the mammary carcinoma, right? It's a mouse model of breast cancer. And the gold shiny signal is the Briller um, collagen one, right? And I have to acknowledge that we point the arrow at the tumor stroma boundary and say collagen one's what, what is what is important. But at the time we were doing these studies, everyone would have pointed the arrow to the tumor stroma boundary and said something's different here, right? But they would have put a different label on this. They might have said cancer associated fibroblasts or hypoxia or TGF beta signaling or various other factors. And I think one thing I want to highlight, use this as an excuse to highlight, is that in addition to 3D culture being a great way to image processes that are hard to access in vivo, it's also a great way to evaluate the impact of different microenvironmental factors that are very difficult to manipulate in vivo. Right? It's difficult to engineer a mouse where you simply replace collagen four for collagen one and have it grow to adulthood. Right? Um, and so whereas it, it's a actually quite quite easy experiment to do with organoids coming from a tumor. So that we're going to test our hypothesis, right? The collagen one, for Briller collagen one in particular, is a key signal promoting invasion of breast tumors, right? The way we're going to do this is take primary human breast tumor, make a whole bunch of organoids from it, and randomly allocate them to different microenvironments, one that models the basement membrane and one that models the stromal extracellular matrix or collagen one. It's the only difference. We're imaging the same time, tissues from the same tumor, they're receiving the same media. I hope you can appreciate a difference in cell behavior there, right? You don't need to be an oncologist or a pathologist to say, wow, the movie on the right looks really gross, 
right? Those cells are just exploding outwards. Um, as it rolls around again this time, look at the timestamp, right? It may take a decade for a metastasis to form, but it's not because it's a slow process once all the pieces are in place for a cancer cell to migrate out of the tumor, right? You get the wrong genotype and the wrong microenvironment in the same place, it's a matter of hours. So I consider the movie on the right to be the most pessimistic, terrifying movie my lab's ever generated. And the movie on the left to be the most optimistic, right? This is tissue from the same tumor with the same media environment, just a different extracellular matrix. And what you're seeing is that those cells are holding together with a coherent boundary. They're not invading or disseminating into the environment. So we've used 3D culture as a general platform for studying the tumor microenvironment. We think a lot of other people can too. So we've generalized this approach to other solid cancers, such as pancreas, liver, lung, bladder, and neuroblastoma. Um, we're using assays like this to screen for inhibitors of growth, invasion, dissemination, immune evasion, and distant metastasis formation. I use that whole um, you know, full breadth of uh, different assays to say that if you want to study metastasis and understand it, you need to understand that it has a series of different steps that represent different cellular challenges and have different molecular requirements. So you need a suite of assays in order to be able to understand what's going on across all of these. We've also been able to selectively incorporate different aspects of the cellular environment, including fibroblasts, innate and adaptive immune cells, and functional engineered blood vessels. The next thing I want to talk about is organized as a platform for testing the role of candidate oncogenes and tumor suppressors. I started on the faculty in 2008, and I was under no illusions that I was going to discover new, common, large effect oncogenes or tumor suppressors. Right? There's a very good list already in 2008, and there was really productive labs with huge sequencing budgets working to discover the rest of them. Where I thought we did have an angle was to understand how gain of an oncogene or loss of a tumor suppressor could affect cell behavior in realistic tissue environments. And just to give you a very simple um, case study in how we do that, let's look at the question of dissemination. Right, The idea of an epithelial cell being induced to exit the epithelium and migrate into the extracellular matrix. And the, the gene we wanted to test, um, we, we, that we tested for its sufficiency in this process was TWIST1. TWIST1 is a basic helix, helix transcription factor. It's well known for its role in EMT, but at the time we initiated these studies, it really wasn't clear whether it was individually sufficient, whether expression of TWIST1 in otherwise normal cells would cause them to leave an epithelium. So we used an engineered um, system where we had um, where doxycycline um, treatment, so antibiotic treatment, induced expression of TWIST1. We're comparing um, cells from the same mouse, right? Either we add dox or leave dox out. We'll have twist off, they'll branch. Twist on, we'll see what happens. For what it's worth, I told the student not to, not to start this project because I didn't think that TWIST1 would, would induce dissemination. So it's really good that my graduate students and postdocs listen to me selectively. I did have the good sense to recognize from the first movie, and this is the first movie, that this was a really good project that would have legs for a decade. Um, so what are we looking at here, right? To my surprise, as well as a number of others, TWIST1 is molecularly sufficient to induce exit from epithelium. This is otherwise normal mammary epithelium from a Charles River FEB mouse, right? Turn on TWIST1 and you'll see the cells are initiating protrusions, migrating out of the epithelium, and watch around here this time around, they're actually going on to form, to proliferate and form secondary sites. To be clear, this isn't metastasis. This isn't even a tumor, right? We don't have an oncogene in here. Um, what we are seeing is most of the cell biological processes that are involved in metastasis occurring in a single field of view downstream of a single transcription factor that we experimentally control. So we thought this would be a terrific platform for identifying the downstream molecular regulators. Across the case studies, across the different molecules that we're looking at, across the different stages of metastasis, the big lesson that I want to convey to you is that cells change their equipment for different tasks, and we can both detect and block those changes. I want you to think of a triathlon, right? Triathlon's got three events. You got to run, you got to swim, you got to bike, right? Triathletes do not take their bikes into the water, right? That would be highly inefficient and unnecessary, right? And so if you watch, what equipment they're getting ready, they're, they're putting on, right? You can guess what their next event's gonna be. They're in a swimsuit, they're about to swim, they put on their running shoes, they're about to run, they grab their bike, they're about to do the, um, the cycling portion. And it's very similar to cancer cells. It turns out each of the steps in metastasis is distinct enough that cells dramatically change their expressed proteins in order to specialize in that task. 
And so you can use RNA-seq during these assays to identify these changes and then use engineering analysis or network analysis um, to prioritize those for functional validation. All of, our, um, all of our network analysis is done in collaboration with Joel Bader here in biomedical engineering. So we just do a very simple experiment and compare exp gene expression between twist on and twist off organ rates in the same matrix. We find 107 genes go up and 76 go down at genome-wide significance. We focused on those that were upregulated because it was easier to imagine targeting them. And a quantitative dissemination assay across a bunch of those targets revealed, um, revealed multiple different molecular independent ways to block dissemination. The paper's been published last year in um, Cancer Research, so I'm just going to talk about our best hit, which was protein kinase D1. It's upregulated at the, gene, at the um, gene expression level. I can say in data that I'm not showing, it is a direct target of twist one, binds to a canonical EBOX. And at the Western blot level, it's strongly induced at the protein level. If you target the PKC PKD pathway, this is protein kinase D1, it's downstream of protein kinase C1, right? Um, if you use either a highly selective, so NBKB14270, it's a highly selective PKD inhibitor, we can block dissemination completely. Challenges, it's not very potent. We also have this other compound, GO6976, these are both commercially available, um, which has some selectivity for PK, it's, it's um, some inhibition of PKC, uh, but it's a very potent inhibitor of PKD1. And you see that here we can block dissemination with an IC50 of 11 and a half nanomolar. It's particularly fun when you're using these um, inhibitors because you can let the process start. Sorry, we will first show um, if we have twist on in both cases and we add drug, you see it completely blocks um, invasion and dissemination. And they actually retain a nice epithelial morphology. But then if we the fun thing about these drugs is you can add them partway through. So you can let it get gross, right? It's invading, it's disseminating. Add the drug, switches to red tracks. You see that the cells that have already escaped stop, and the epithelium reestablishes epithelial integrity at a nice boundary. So we think that's pretty exciting. Um, we next went on to test whether this was teaching us something about cancer or only about our engineered assay. So we, tried, we looked in a couple of different genetically engineered mouse models, and we settled on C31 tianogen because it expresses twist one and PRKD1, right? And it turns out that if you um, inhibit, if you add um, GO6976, you block invasion dissemination potently. We then tried a couple of different rounds, six tumors each, of primary human breast tumors in the clinic, and also showed potent inhibition of invasion and dissemination. So next we wanted to test the requirement of PKD1 in vivo, right? So we used shRNA, two different shRNA constructs targeting um, PRKD1. When we validated, they gave the same results in vitro as treatment with the drug. And we're able to show, if you look on the left, we have a non-targeted shRNA. And you'll see that these tumors have really gross um, infiltrating columns. There's just lots of um, collective um, infiltrating invasion here, right? So the border is very, um, it's very ragged. And if we block um, PRKD1 with shRNA, you see you convert to a non-invasive or pushing boundary with a subsequent traumatic reduction in distant metastasis. SH, the SH um, or hairpin 2 did not as effectively reduce um, PRKD1 and gave an intermediate field type. So 3D culture, I think, is a powerful platform for, for identifying therapeutics because we can build these stage specific models of different metastatic processes. We can do gene at a time or systematic screens. Recent work in the lab has extended this to 1,000 gene CRISPR um, scale and 1,000 compound um, drug screen. And our starting point I want to emphasize is always iso freshly isolated tumors. We're not using cell lines. We're not um, passaging or freezing our organoids. So everything's coming right out of the tumor into the assay. We think this is very important because the survival, the survival signals um, seem to be quite different in these freshly isolated tumors than they are after the cells have been in culture for a long time. OK, I'm going to tell you another short story here, which, is, which was absolutely completely by surprise. Okay, so I'll remind you that metastasis begins with the dissemination of cancer cells into normal tissue. So ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, is, an, is not um, um, invasive or metastatic, and it is differentiated um, by pathologists from invasive ductal carcinoma by the fact that the cancer cells are inside the myoepithelium in the basement membrane. Once the cancer cells break through the myoepithelium in the basement membrane, it's classified as invasive ductal carcinoma. DCIS has a five-year disease survival over 99%. In 
invasive duct carcinomas over 73%. So it's a really significant difference. And what are pathologists looking at? Fundamentally, what they're looking at is the relationship of the cancer cells to the myoepithelium. So we essentially cheated, right? And we decided that if every single um, pathologist in the world is looking at the relationship between these two cell types, we should too, right? We should probably start a project that looked at it. Um, and try to get at this question of how does a cancer cell escape past the myoepithelium? Um, so what we did here is we used um, just some subtle genetic variations on our twist one assay, right? So we're instead we're now able to drive twist one either mosaically, right? With tissue from the same animal, we're able to drive it mosaically. So both luminal and myoepithelial cells express twist one. That's all the experiments you've seen so far, or exclusively in the luminal compartment with a normal myoepithelium. It seems like a small difference, right? Because the gene expression inside the luminal cells is the same, right? So what do we see when we do that? Luminal specific twist one induction rarely results in dissemination. When we express it in both populations, most organoids disseminate and they disseminate vigorously. Lots of cells leave. When we express only in the luminal cells, very few organoids disseminate. And when they do, it tends to be one or two cells that got away. So how does this work? Um, we did a bunch of imaging here where we um, selectively labeled the myoepithelial cells with genetic tricks so that we could see the myoepithelial cells in green and invasive populations in red. We actually did it four different ways. So we had two different triggers for invasive behavior, loss of ecoherin or gain of um, twist one, and we tested it in two different tumor models. And what we're able to see is that the myoepithelial cells restrain and contain invading luminal cells. So look at that that chain of red luminal cells. It reaches out, it makes contact with the extracellular matrix. The myopthelium reaches around it and shoves it back in. I have a very active six-year-old son, Michael, and he loves to sprint away. And he sometimes does that when we're walking on the sidewalk near the street. So I've had to learn to get really quick at reaching my hand out, grabbing his shirt collar, and keeping him from getting into traffic. And it seems like the myopthelial cells are fundamentally doing the same thing. Here, you're looking at cancer cells invading, my, normal myoepithelial is restraining. And you see, even when the cancer cells get away, there's actually a complete gap there between the cancer cells and the tissue. The myoepithelial cells are able to reach out, grab them, and pull them back inside the tissue. So what did we learn from that? That myoepithelial cells actively and efficiently restrain both luminal and basal phenotype cancer cell invasion. Myoepithelial cells can reestablish tissue integrity, right? You can go from an invasive front to a well-organized tissue. And that this barrier function is fundamentally collective and depends on myoepithelial abundance, intercellular adhesion, and smooth muscle contractility. Okay, so I told you a story about normal development, right? We talked about um, the extracellular matrix. We talked about twist one, and then we talked about the myoepithelium. And now I wanna shift focus and just squarely focus on what I call the natural history of the tumor. How does it work when we're not playing with it, right? When we're not trying to force it to be twist one dependent, trying to force it to be one dependent. We have a tumor in front of us. How is it actually metastasizing, right? And I like to say that this whole project, my original training was in physics. I was an undergrad in physics and a PhD in biophysics. This whole project stems from my inability to look at a slide like this and decide what's important. I see lots of things. My eyes work fine. But I see almost too many things. And I've heard too many stories about this tumor, right? So we have dark spindly cells reminiscent of EMT, right? Pale round cells reminiscent of cancer stem cells. We have cells invading the muscle, we have cells invading the fat, and we have these streaks, these pink streaks of immune cells going in. So there's cancer cells adjacent to macrophages, cancer-associated fibroblasts that could be inducing behavior. So what matters here, right? I wish I figured out immediately on using these assays. Instead, it was a 10-year process to realize that we don't need to guess in advance, right? We can let the cells tell us. So I want you to think of each of these um, organoids is fundamentally being a really gross little ice cream scoop from the tumor, right? From one of those big genetically engineered mouse models, we get 250,000 really gross little ice cream scoops that each has a different set of cancer cells, right? Re reflecting the local heterogeneity in that exact part of the tumor. We put them in a 3D collagen one environment like this, and we can just let the cells tell us who invades best, right? And then we can just have a really trivial hypothesis that the cells that invade right? At the front of this column, we'll call them invasive leader cells, are probably better at invading than the cells that remain in the bulk. And with each experiment, we can look at it a quarter million times. So by the time you've looked at 
half dozen, 10, 20 tumors, you've got millions of examples. To understand the next data, I need to remind you, mammary epithelium is a tube with two really compartments rather than cell types. We have a basal compartment and a luminal compartment. And to prevent confusion, that basal compartment has two different types of cells. It has myoepithelial cells and it has basal cells, right? They're differentiated because the basal cells do not have um, smooth muscle contracting proteins. They don't have things like smooth muscle actors, but also myosin. This isn't just a feature of the normal development of the gland. In fact, medical oncologists and medical oncologists think about, talk about, and manage patients based on this basal versus luminal difference in their tumor. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that one, one patient has 100% basal phenotype cells and another patient 0%, right? They're a mix, but you categorize them as basal or luminal based on the predominant average phenotype, right? So if you do Western blots or you do a microarray, you do IHC and look at a slide, right? It's mostly basal, mostly luminal. The big surprise we had on this project was that in this luminal mouse model, so MMTB polyomal middle T, the mouse model of luminal B breast cancer, the cells leading invasion expressed basal epithelial genes, right? So green is specifically at the front of the column here. And these cells have a different cell shape and behavior than the red cells that are constituting the bulk of the tumor, right? If these leaders are K14, K5, these are cytokeratins, intermediate filament proteins, um, K5, K14, P63, P adherin positive. They are negative for smooth muscle actin, smooth muscle myosin, and calponin. So I'm not talking about myopathy cells here. I'm talking about basal phenotype cancer cell. And it turns out when you look in the tumors, so this is just a 3D reconstruction of a significant chunk of a um, MMT polyamide middle T luminal tumor. The first thing you see, so what we're coding here is blue is luminal, green is basal phenotype, and red is muscle. The first thing you see is that blue far outvotes green. So it's completely fair to call this a luminal tumor. The second thing you see is that the cell is doing the bad stuff, invading into the muscle. And the ones that I didn't highlight, right, it's not selective. The ones I didn't highlight as well, more than 90% of them, are expressing these basal epithelial genes. So we wanted to figure out, is this just a clever observation in a single mouse model, or is this general? And this is one of the few um, shivers down the spine moments in my career, right? Because we were expecting, as everyone else was, um, that there would be subtype-specific um, programs of invasion. And so... Um, and that, in fact, this might only be operating in luminal B. So we looked at three different subtypes. We looked at HER2 overexpressing luminal B and basal breast cancer in mouse models, right, of these subtypes. And we saw, well, like a Goldilocks, you have a small amount, a large amount, a medium amount of invasion, very different morphologies. We saw keratin-14 positive cells leading invasion in all three subtypes. When we collaborated with Ed Gabrielson in pathology, he was able to identify keratin-14 positive cells leading collective invasion in tumors across the major subtypes of breast cancer, luminal A, luminal B, HER2 positive, and triple A. This is not the only way that breast cancer cells can invade and metastasize, but it is a conserved mechanism across the subtypes. What we next wanted to understand is how this collective invasion process could relate to tistin metastasis, right? Because fundamentally, invasion right, invasion strand is a local feature of the tumor projecting into the adjacent stroma, right? How does that help you grow on the lungs? And again, it took years. The change happened in, my, in, in our brains rather than in our assays to realize that a rocket on the launch pad in Cape Canaveral is also a local feature, right? It's a local feature of the Florida landscape until you push go, and then that rocket can take off into, the, into outer space. So these collective invasion strands, in the same way we've watched it a few times now, can launch clusters of cancer cells. And we were able to do a lineage analysis in which we labeled primary tumors in different colors. We did a two color, a four color, and a 21 color system. So we have different colors in the primary tumor. We were able to show that these cells are traveling in multicolored, multicolonal groups through the body to land as multicellular, multicolored groups in the distant organs and grow up into multicolor, multicellular, multicolonal metastases. Collectively, what I've shown you so far led us to propose the model of collective epithelial metastasis. This idea that groups of cells are invading and disseminating. They're maintaining epithelial gene expression, such as K14 and EP urine. They require epithelial genes, such as keratin-14. And it's fundamentally about these clusters traveling. We think there's an important transition in cell state as the cells move to a keratin-14 positive cell state. This lets them migrate and evade the immune system and then transition back 
to occur in 14 negative cell state to proliferate the distal organ. This is a common mechanism, as far as we can tell, across mouse models and patients. It is not the only way, right? We get in trouble in cancer research when we try to say that the one thing we, that we look at the most is the only thing that happens. This is not the only way to metastasize. We do think it's a frequent mechanism. So if it's all about groups, right? If groups of cells are doing this job, then it seems like it has to partly be about cell-cell adhesion. So we wanted to understand the role of cell-cell adhesion here. And we got a surprising result. So we compared keratin-14 positive, keratin-14 negative cells by RNA-seq. The EMT model would predict a down-regulation of cell adhesion proteins in the cells that are metastasizing through the body. Instead, we saw an up-regulation. In fact, keratin-14 positive cells were up-regulating components of the hemidesmosome, so an epithelial cell matrix adhesion um, system, the desmosome, an epithelial cell cell adhesion system, and genes like E. cadherin and P. cadherin. I didn't know how to start thinking about cell adhesion in cancer without first working on E. cadherin. For those who don't think about this every day, I'll just remind you E. cadherin is an um, adhesion receptor. It directly bridges the intercellular space. Cadherin molecules connect to each other and then accumulate um, intracellular proteins like P120, catenin, and beta catenin and um, connect to the actin cytoskeleton and through alpha catenin. Okay? And it's a very simple model, a very compelling model, emerged in the 90s for how, e for how E. cadherin related to invasion and metastasis, which was that E. cadherin was a tumor suppressor, invasion suppressor, and metastasis suppressor. The basis for this model was the um, inverse relationship between invasive behavior in 2D culture and cadherin expression. So if a particular cell line had lots of cadherin, it had little spontaneous motility. If it had lots of motility, it had little spontaneous, it had little E. cadherin protein. And you could actually overexpress E. cadherin in 231 cells, and they would form clusters. This seemed less dangerous at the time, but given the data I just showed you, it's not necessarily true that forcing clusters will make you less metastatic. So this was very consistent across cell lines, and it's it explains metastasis in diffuse gastric cancer and invasive lobular carcinoma of the breast. However, invasive lobular carcinoma is only about 10% of breast cancer. Invasive ductal carcinoma is about 90% of breast cancer. Invasive ductal carcinoma, the primary tumor, and the distant metastases retain um, E. cadherin expression. And in fact, the distant metastases overexpress E. cadherin. Right? So I didn't understand what it would mean genetically for a gene to be a metastasis suppressor if it's expressed in the metastases, right? So we decided to test this. We took some models of invasive breast cancer and tested the role of E. cadherin genetically. So here we're using Rolf Kimmler's E. cadherin allele, um, so it's flocks to allele, and we've bred it into a couple of different genetically engineered mouse models. We'll use a couple of different Cree tricks to excise it at, the, at specific times and places, and we can keep track of which cells are which with a Cree reporter. So the first thing we wanted to test is whether loss of E. cadherin promoted invasion of metastasis. Dozens of papers from the 90s suggested it would. And dozens of papers were right. Okay, So this is, um, um, if we take away E. cadherin, we see a dramatic and almost immediate increase in invasive behavior. This is, these are organoids from the same tumor, grown in the same collagen, and treated with the same media image at the same time. Right? The only difference is we've taken away E. cadherin. And you look on the right, it's just exploding. I will remind you that the unperturbed states, the current positive state on the left, is metastatic to the lungs in 95% of mice. So it may look puny and unimpressive in the movie, right? But it's killing the mice very efficiently. So let's test this in vivo as well, right? So we went, we went and looked in vivo, the unmanipulated case, right? So you could hear in plus plus. You see most edges in this tumor are pushing boundaries. Right? So it's really striking how metastatic it is and given how little invasive behavior there is in the margins of the tumor. Take away E. cadherin, you get all these infiltrating boundaries. Invasive boundary goes from 6% to 82% of the tumor. So E. cadherin loss, consistent with all those papers, clearly promotes um, invasion dissemination. So it is an invasion suppressor. Right? But what about metastasis? So to test this, we do the same experiment, but we transplant into the you know, cleared mammary fat pad, let tumors grow up and assay in the lungs. And what we see is that loss of E. cadherin abrogates the ability of these, former, these tumors to form metastases. We only got one metastatic site in one mouse you know, that we studied here. And we looked at this in two invasive ductal carcinoma models, one of luminal and one of invasive breast cancer. So we had this uncoupling of the efficiency of invasion and metastasis 
following I, you can hear loss and IEC loss, where we got more invasion and dissemination and less metastasis. For this manuscript, we had four reviewers who were very conscientious and thoughtful. So we got to explore a wide range of new experiments. And we're able to say, it was actually really good for us, but um, it was painful. Um, but we're able to put this slide up now um, and summarize a huge amount of work for graduate students in one, one cartoon, which is to say that um, these cancer cells got better at invading and disseminating, but worse at directional migration, worse at getting into the circulation, worse at surviving in the circulation, worse at getting out and seeding distant um, sites. Even when you, when you adjust for their poor efficiency at arrival, they were still separately worse at surviving the distant site and proliferating the distant site. So it's like a chemical reaction. You made the first step go better and every subsequent step go much worse. So there's no product at the end. So how do we think this works? Now, we think most breast cancers are ecoderm positive and metastasized while retaining and requiring ecoderm expression. And when we take it away, what we showed is you get increase in TGF beta signaling, increase in reactive oxygen accumulation, and an increase in cleave cascades three leading to cell death. Right? So ecoderm is actually directly acting as a survival factor in these cancer cells. So what are the broader lessons from this study? The broader lessons are that metastasis is a multi-step process. So a faster start doesn't necessarily equal a stronger finish. Second lesson is that different cancers, even in the same organ, could rely upon or need to lose the same gene, right? Invasive lobular carcinoma loses ecoderm to metastasize. Invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast has to retain ecoderm to metastasize. This idea of a general metastasis suppressor really may not hold. I want to also add that some primary tumors seem addicted to their epithelial gene expression, right? You take it away, they don't do well. They may simultaneously be addicted to mesenchymal gene expression and are working very actively right now on the role of hybrid EMT um, across different cancer types. And the last big idea here is that systemic dissemination is stressful and e adherent is aiding the survival of the cancer cells. We're currently working on ways to target the survival signaling because we think it could be an effective way to clear out disseminated cancer cells wherever they are in the body. Where are we going with this? We're working um, with, genetic, with CRISPR based genetic screens to systematically define the regulators of collective epithelial metastasis. Trying to define the survival pathways downstream of e -cadherin. We don't want to target e -cadherin. it's an essential gene. But to understand what are the survival pathways downstream of e that are mediating the survival of disseminated cancer cells. We also want to test the limits of our model, right? Once we have something we think is working, we try to rush to the edge of it and figure out where are we wrong? Where does our model stop working? So we're working very actively on hybrid EMT. Um, and we're working on identifying therapeutic strategies to eliminate disseminated cancer cells and defining essential roles for the immune system regulating metastasis. I want to close by thanking my laboratory. I promise you no one was brought into inappropriate distance in the making of this photograph. It's actually photoshopped completely from people standing far apart. Um, but this is the laboratory that got, that got our lab through COVID. Right? They showed up in the middle, right? um, kept the lab, kept the essential things running during our complete shutdown for three months. And the first day they were allowed back in, they went back and uh, hit the ground running. I have, um, so I want to thank them immensely for that. Um, we have diverse support from federal agencies and from foundations. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I, want, I really welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Andy. That was a really nice compilation of lots of nice stories. Um, so just to remind the audience that if you want to ask a question, I'd encourage you to you know, raise your hand so you can unmute and ask yourself. Um, otherwise, I can read it out from the chat. Um, Roberta, you've got your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Hi, Andy. Very nice, very nice talk. Um, so I have a question about the last part about the academy. So you show, I mean, you, you uh, uh, mentioned the conclusion that uh, ecadrin seems to be required for cell migration of this of this uh, cancer cells. Um, do you know if this requirement is because of the collectiveness, or do you know if ecadrin is required for the motility of single cells, or what is the mechanism? What sure. by which so ecadrin? They're worse at is directional migration. It was true both for single cells and small clusters because we quantified that after they disseminated away from the organoids. Um, we don't have we don't have a unique take on the molecular mechanism here, um, but I would. Um, but Matsutoshi Takaichi has um, implicated the um, alpha catenin directly in direction sensing and single cell migration, and so we um, we do mechanism by citation in this case, and we say that that's likely that likely we've interfered with catenin balance 
in a way that's breaking the cellular compass. They're not slow and they're not bad at, they're better at releasing. What they're bad at doing is persistent migration, persistent directional migration. We yeah. do not understand it completely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hmm. Huh? Uh, yeah, hi. I'll ask my questions that I put into the, the um, chat. Uh, that was a really nice talk, Andy. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, two quick questions. Uh, whether inhibiting the uh, integrin that binds the collagen one blocks, does that block invasion? So I'm terrified of integrin signaling. So um, we haven't done anything directly with integrins. Um, we've done, um, if you block either FAC or SARC, you block you block invasion. Well, I'm just saying like you put in the antibody to the, you know, inhibitory antibody to the... Uh, we just we haven't done the experiment. Um, the inhibitory antibodies tend to be human, not mouse. And so if anyone has um, mouse antibodies um, to any of the relevant integrins, we'd be, we'd be delighted to test them. But we don't have any unique reagents on that front. We haven't done the experiment. It's a great experiment. So the other question is about the PKD stuff. What, I don't know, what does PKD signaling do? Is it acting on like all of our favorite cell migration pathways or what? It is. So we did, we did, a, um, we did a readout of the, the protein consequences of PKD activity. Because if you have um, twist off, right, um, you have no PKD. Twist on, you have PKD and lots of migration. And then we have essentially a mild inhibition with that one drug and a strong inhibition with the second drug. So we put um, we collected protein samples from those and put them on a Conexus um, array, which is essentially just a multiplexed ELISA, right? So it's not a perfect experiment, but it let us look at a lot of different things in parallel. And what you saw was strong regulation of the actin and microtubule cytoskeletons, things like tau, um, Greek cofilin was on there. And then we followed up on a couple of them, including beta-catenin. So there's actually an inactivating phosphorylation beta-catenin which is PRKD1 dependent, um, and which is likely how the cells are releasing from the epithelium. So the data from but that- But what, what's in the literature? I mean, what does PKD phosphorylate? Lots of things, but including- Like, like, like what that would be upstream ERC, of ERC, cell ERC, migration? Um, what's that? ERK pathway. It hits okay. lots of pathway members. We can send you the data. It's, no, but I don't it's want to see your data. <laughs> it hits basic, the, the basic problem is- I don't even hits, want to read your papers. I want you to tell me stories in person. Right. <laughs> Basically, it hits too many pathways. We have, a, we have a partial understanding of it, but not enough. It's overdetermined. It, it hits six pathways you're interested in. We don't know which is most important. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Colin? Uh, hi, yeah. I just had a question about- um, so the clusters and the metastasizing, uh, the clusters that metastasize. So do you think that E could here in positive and negative cells could like, piggyback on one another? And so if you have... So yeah. simple answer, yes. Um, I also want to say that probably during metastasis, it, in invasive ductal carcinoma, it's not so much about positive and negative, but high and low. Um, so in, in um, invasive lobular carcinoma, they genuinely lose it. It's deleted. It's often um, a loss of heterozygosity from a familial um, um, heterozygosity in naked hearing. But invasive ductal carcinoma, I think one of the things by studying the extreme, it's present or it's completely absent. We got a clean look at something that is probably a matter of high and low during normal metastasis. And I think what, you sh what we were able to show was that if you can downregulate your naked hearing a bit, right, you'll get a big migratory advantage. But you go too far and you're going to die, right? So it's this fine balance where turning you can hear down, you'll migrate more. But you got to keep enough survival signaling to make it all the way to the distant site. Probably cancer cells get this wrong a lot of the time. Metastasis is tremendously inefficient, right? Most of the cells that leave the tumor don't form a metastasis. But I think that what, we'd, what you'd normally see is modulation of that um, and that it could be extremely advantageous for a cluster to be heterogeneous and you can hear Thank you. I'm here. Hi, Andy. Excellent talk. Um, just following up on the question that Colin asked and for the characterization of hybrid, do you see mixtures of cells in those uh, hybrid scenarios that you're talking about? And the second question goes back to the first half of the talk where you talked about asymmetric uh, division. 
So is ecadron also known to be asymmetrically dividing in certain scenarios and can that play a role in metastasis? Sure. Um, in those asymmetric, I'll do the second question first. The asymmetric cell division, both cells had ecadron as far as we could tell at equivalent levels. Um, so I don't think that that was a determinant there. Um, a number of other polarity um, um, complexes were asymmetric, including um, things like NUM and CAR3. We should really talk about hybrid EMT sometime. Um, I can say that we're observing it, this won't surprise you, we're observing it frequently in triple negative breast cancer. That's where you'd expect based on gene expression analysis. We don't see mixed clusters where the same cluster has a, an EMT cell and a collective invasion. We do see tumors where this clone in the tumor is collectively invading and this clone in the tumor is doing hybrid EMT. We published that last year in pancreatic cancer and people with Laura Wood. We have a manuscript out for review right now in triple negative um, breast cancer showing that that's the case, um, that the tumor can have both programs running at the same time in different cell populations. So essentially that it's sending, um, sending bad cells out into the circulation with fundamentally different molecular um, programs for survival and dissemination. And does uh, the hybrid cells yeah. have transcriptionally uh, low levels of e cadet or is it localization based? Transcriptionally, it's um, lower. I don't know that I would call it low. They still absolutely require sure. e to survive. Right. Um, that's why we're calling it hybrid. They're functionally requiring both the metin and e um, Sorry, what was the other part of that question? The localization. Is it the localization oh, difference or is it a. Um, we're working hard to try to understand if, if a mislocalized e cadherin, the difference between whether a mislocalized e cadherin, meaning not at the membrane, is that a functional right. role or does it have another role? We don't have the answer yet, um, but we think, we'll, we think we'll get there in the next six months. All right, Thank, thanks so much. We, we, we'll talk offline. Anisha? Uh, yeah, uh, hi. Uh, what type of antibodies are you are you using in the Western world? And the second question is why you are uh, doing a cross covalence test? Sorry, for uh, which protein did you want the antibodies? In the Western blood. I think I showed more than one Western blood. For which protein? I mean, uh, uh, in the in the in the PKD, what type oh, okay. of antibodies? Yeah. Sure. So that one's in um, PKD. So we always put the clone number and the part number in the um, method section. So that one's in um, cancer research um, in January uh, 2020. And so that's Dan Georges. If I try to remember the clone off the top of my head, it'll be wrong. But, it, but you can look it up there. And then the second part of the question was why the Chris Call Wallace? Um, yeah. That was dictated by the um, uh, normality of the so is the is the Kruskal Wallace test? Are you are you doing analysis on that? Like uh, based on the graph, are you are you using that? So which one are you asking about there? In the in the PKD, are you using a graph for the of uh, for the Kruskal Wallace test? Why you are using this? Yeah, so it's a non-parametric ANOVA. And we you use it when you're comparing more than two conditions and when you're having um, when your data is not normally distributed. Okay. So that was you know, the data tell you which, which statistical test to use. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jojo? Uh, hi, Andy. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, whether you think or you have evidence that e expression is required also once the metastasis form. So in other words, would you see a regression of metastasis if you knock yep. down e in metastatic site? Yes. Yeah, and so the other question- Unpublished data, I'm happy to share on that. Because uh, it, it was one of those paranoid things we did when the when the ecoderm paper was out for its last round of review, but isn't in the paper. <laughs> um, so if you transplant, so you take the cells, flocks, flocks, or plus plus, right? Equal numbers of cells organizes clusters, two different mice, but you have not deleted it, right? It's a tamoxifen inducible system. Right. You allow them to grow up for a week. You treat both cohorts with tamoxifen, so that that's equivalent, right? But the plus plus, it doesn't do anything. Sorry, the the one that lacks the um, Tamoxifen inducible Cree, it doesn't do anything, right? And the other side does. Um, yes, two weeks later, very different metastases. So it isn't just in the blood, it isn't just in the landing and the immediate survival, it continues to be important. What we're doing now is testing, because we've got a, we've got a whole um, foundation, the Metaviber Foundation is basically telling us, think about the patients who already have the metastases. There will always be people who break through, no matter how good prevention is, there are people who have metastases. So we're pushing that further out. How far can we go? How big and gross can they get right. um, and still have a major um, effect from the loss of e I can say from our primary data, data in the primary tumor, we think probably really big and gross. 
because we there's buried in the supplement of that paper, we deleted ECAD here in late, and we saw an immediate turn uh -huh. in the caliper measurements of the primary tumor. Um, so we think it continues to be required. And the other question was regarding like collective motion. So what, I mean, well, I was very intrigued by a paper by Peter Frieda that shows that like if you increase confinement and then you can get like collective motion even in absence of ECA hearing. So I just like to ask your take on that. So I would say um, I have, I'm fascinated by that work too. Um, and our work <laughs> on collection invasion is very much inspired by his work and is in dialogue with him. We talk to him regularly. Um, so I would say we're working in an intermediate stiffness and pore size um, in his schema. So we're working typically at three to four mg per mil collagen. Uh -huh, uh -huh, we uh -huh. force them to assemble into large fibers. There's a reasonable pore size there. Um, I think his conclusions are what they are, right? You can, you know, cells can be forced to interact with each other um, even without E. coherent. Um, and it's important to remember too, that there's lots of adhesion proteins other than classical coherence. Yeah. And there's lots of classical coherence other than E. coherent. And so um, there's many ways that cells can stick to each other um, beyond these really high affinity systems. So yeah, I think it's fascinating. We're, we're working on um, those angles. We're actually, we have some fun experiments right now checking whether other classical coherence can uh -huh. be coherent in the survival role. Yeah, thank you. And you can I check, are you okay, okay to stay on for a few more minutes? We've got I a few more yeah, questions. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna start going through the questions from the chat. Um, so Henry Francois Renard asks if you've ever looked at the role of CAM family proteins in the invasive Very behavior. CAM, CAM family? Uh, no, it'd be good to do, but uh, we have a smaller lab. Uh, we've got about 10 people. So um, we're, we always are making choices about what to uh, work on and what not to. Uh, Natasha uh, says, fantastic work. In your twist on off experiment, does the twist off scenario have more proliferation, the tumor seems larger. The organoids seem larger because we, we didn't test that in the tumor. Um, I don't remember, I don't think they dramatically started growing, um, but I will say that the twist on, the opposite was true, right? So if you forced twist expression, there was a, there was a marked decrease in growth, right? So somehow that pushed the cells to a more, um, more migratory, less proliferative state. So the, you know, the organoid, you know, in the, if the branching organoid was this big, right, the twist one positive one would be this big. And that was you know, present in the movie, but it was also true quantitatively across it. Um, I don't know that we got reversion um, of that growth completely in the short acid time we assayed, but I don't know that we measured that very carefully. We would expect that you would. Uh, second question from Natasha was, have you tested the tumor cell response with collagen one cultures of different stiffnesses, uh, for example, yes. activation being sensitive to ECM stiffness. So close to that. What we did test was um, we varied the stiffness of matrigel, right, across um, from about 50 to about 3,000 pascals, paper and biomaterials in 2013. And we were able to show that that actually inhibited proliferation, simply changing shear elastic modulus inhibited proliferation without inducing invasion. It was only when we incorporated nanoscale adhesive cues into the gels that we were able to induce dissemination of nature gel purely by changing the matrix. Um, what we did in the collagen is a, a buried result um, in the journal of microscopy was we were able to show that it was that the induction of dissemination is very selectively about the large feature size collagen one. So we polymerized collagen gels for different amounts of time that correlated with different the assembly of larger and larger features and the um, induction of invasion really correlated with those large feature size. So um, that's not exactly the same as stiffness, right? But this, the um, supramolecular architecture of the collagen one was absolutely regulating the induction of invasion. Thanks. And the third question from Natasha was, do you think that the ECAD expression would vary in the matrigel versus the collagen seeded tumor cells? Not that we've noticed so far. Um, would I think that it would? Yeah, I would think that it would, but I don't think that it has. It varies quite a bit between mouse models and quite a bit between patient tumors. Okay, great. Um, questions from Parag, uh, Kitira, Kitira, sorry if I said it wrong. Um, is the expression or need of expression of cell-cell adhesion proteins ECM environment specific? I'm trying to remember, um, we've done not 
um, we did that kind of an old fashioned way with microarrays um, years ago, and it wasn't notably so. The expression of ECM proteins and ECM modifying enzymes was strikingly, um, can be strikingly different, um, but the expression of the cell adhesion proteins, not as much, but the data is old at this point. And there's much more sensitive ways to do it now. So I would say we have best to say that um, it should be reevaluated with modern with modern methods. And um, second question was, in the epithelial tube extension and branching, have you looked at the role of nuclear lamina? La nuclear lamina? <laughs> Only for about six weeks. Um, so we have a new postdoc working who's really interested in um, nuclear architecture and, and uh, genome folding, um, who just started, um, who's really interested in that. So we've got um, lamina um, is interested in the differential in some of our um, assays. So we're, we're starting to look at that, but no conclusions to relate yet. Thanks. Uh, Tim, do you want to ask your question yourself? Or do you want me to read that? Sure. Hey, Andy, it's so nice to see you and uh, another wonderful talk. Um, I just keep coming back to your result um, on uh, Twist and the subsequent paper in Nature. And I just, I just, many of our friends here on this call probably are used to justifying um, their interest in studying cell invasion because of its relevance to metastasis. And so I wonder if you're, so without being um, unfair to anyone else, myself included, um, working to kind of figure out biomedical relevance for the cell uh, migratory phenotypes that we're interested in studying. I just am curious if um, there's not a direct core, or there's not a direct link in your studies between invasion in your assays and metastatic outgrowth. Um, one to one linear link. It doesn't right. necessarily um, advantage you to go faster than you're currently going. If you think of that three panel um, series that I had early in the K14 studies, you had a um, herb B2 that was invading a tiny bit. The polyoma middle T is invading a moderate amount and the C31T antigen is going crazy, right? The one in the middle is actually the most metastatic by far, right? Mm -hmm. But um, is, is migration and invasion relevant to metastasis? Absolutely, right? If the epithelial cancer cell doesn't leave the tumor, right? The, breast, the surgeon cures the cancer, right? So you have to acquire an, a, a migratory program in order to, um, in order to leave. So right. I absolutely think it's required. Um, Hope that, uh, that our paper wasn't written in a way that didn't seem that way. It's just that it doesn't necessarily advantage you to go faster, right? You need to, you need to have enough migration to get away and enough survival to complete the process. Is that a I guess, Yeah, no, well, I mean, absolutely agree. I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm curious if um, the uh, wide variation you see in invasion is telling you something else about the biology of these tumor cells that is maybe not directly related to their metastatic potential. So the way we think about it, um, the way we think about it is that epithelial cells, so uh, I'm gonna get um, speculative and big picture on you for a second, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Transition from being single cells, right? Where it's every cell for himself, right? And you divide, and if, if you win, you make the most yeast, that's fine, right? You transition to multicellularity. All of a sudden, you need most of your liver cells, most of your breast epithelial cells, to not divide for years to decades, right? So there's intense levels of um, regulation, negative regulation on proliferation, on apoptosis, right, on migration. You need to break through those levels of, of, um, um, of, re of repression in order to form a tumor and metastasize, right? And I think at the deep level, epithelial cells are programmed to be checking, am I attached to my neighbors? Am I attached to the base of membrane, right? And you're constantly checking. Right? And if either of those sensors go negative, apoptosis is the correct answer. So if you just micropipette an epithelial cell out of the epithelium and you put it in suspension, right, it should die. Mm -hmm. Things have to be broken inside its genome for that not to kill it. Right? And so how does, how does metastasis work? EMT represents a program where you can overcome all of that. Right? You, can, you can reset the rules and you can survive as an individual cell. But what it's looking like to us is that's less common in breast cancer than this collective program. And the collective program fundamentally relies on cheating. The epithelial cells keep just enough, right? Three to five to 10 other cells around and just enough matrix of their own around 
that those sensors kind of read positive, right? I've, I've, got, I've got a couple neighbors, right? I've got a little bit of matrix. And then some of those clusters survive, whereas the single cells are mostly cleared, right? So I think that's what's going on. So you have collective invasion is not a great migration strategy in a lot of ways, right? But what it does is it represents a balance between the need to pull the sensors that you have cell adhesion and cell matrix adhesion in place enough to get to the distant site. That's our current theory. Right. Um, question from Ufna. Uh, do you think the loss of polarity affects luminal cell behavior like milk production? Ooh. Um, work from Ian McCara and Luke McCaffrey strongly suggests that loss of polarity, so if you disrupt things like PAR3, you disrupt basic programs in branch morphogenesis. Um, we're, and they've extended that to at least some aspects of accelerating tumor progression. Uh, we're working actively on that now. We're knocking down different aspects of the apical junctional complex, whether polarity or tight junction, to understand their role in, uh, in regulating epithelial cell behavior and potentially in enabling um, cancer progression. But that project's at an early stage, so we don't, have, we don't really have conclusions to share here. So likely, yes, um, to, to be continued. Thanks. Um, Malika asks uh, if you've looked at the ECAD in the twist on off experiment. Oh, yeah. Um, those, those cells continue to express E coherent. And they actually require, yeah, that's the 2014 JCP paper. They require E coherent in order to release from each other. So if you delete E coherent, they form these long, thin strands with a twist one positive, their ultras are positive, but with a protrusive cell at the front and then a chain of cells behind. And so E coherent in that, in that specific context is involved in separating the cells from each other. Um, we think it's to do with coordination of myosin. Thanks. Um, Anna Passapera, do you think that ECAD is required to promote a dependent mechanical circuit to integrate adhesion, contractile forces, and biochemical signaling to drive the polarized organi organization and junctional tension required to sustain metastasis? Yes, we think that's how it works. No, we don't have any evidence yet. Um, we're going to be getting in some tension sensors to be able to look at that directly because we can use our um, tamoxifen inducible CRE to remove ecoherin whenever we want in whichever cells we want um, and then add back different forms of ecoherin, including tension sensors. At this point, we think um, it's likely very importantly integrating, working in that exact way, but we don't yet have evidence for it. Great, thank you very much. And um, a similar-ish question on, on YouTube asking about, might the loss of the migratory direction be ablated by loss of mechano signaling that ECAD provides? There may be a dysregulation of ECM production and remodeling, which is essential for effective migration. The best answer to that is that that sounds very plausible. Um, and we really don't know why, they're, why the ecoherin and negative cells are bad at directional migration. And the final question, but I think we've had a similar question earlier. Have you looked at the relationship between ECAD and collagen 4 in the invasion ability of cells? I'm trying to think. We have not done any experimental manipulations of collagen 4 other than the matrix switching experiments. We haven't knocked it down or added antibodies against it. So we really can't comment functionally on collagen four. Thanks. Um, I'm the past pair just with a last question. How long do you treat with tamoxifen in your inducible systems? Do you, um, do you worry about estrogen inhibition of that um, oh, possible side effects? Going. We treat for a relatively short time. I think it's 24 hours, but really the best thing to do is check the methods paper because we're determining um, how long to treat based on induction of, based on ex how long it takes to excise the allele. We're working orders of magnitude lower in concentration than what you would do to inhibit um, inhibit estrogen. This is in the um, tens of nanomolar range, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and the way we, we do worry about it, but the way we control for any effects is that we'll do it plus and minus tamoxifen, but we'll also engineer other mice so that we can have plus plus versus flox flox and then have tamoxifen on both sides. So we use um, control experiments to, to test for and control for any effect of tamoxifen generally. So we don't have it as a um, confounding variable for any of the conclusions. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. That was the last of the questions there. Um, that was a really nice presentation. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed that.
So thanks very much. Thank you so much. It was a tremendously stimulating uh, discussion section. Great. Uh, so if anyone has anything they want to say to Andy before we end up, do so now. <laughs> <laughs>